On this episode of the Whistle Wave podcast, I'm really excited. I get to sit down and interview one of the rising stars, not only within my personal team, but just in the real estate world in general, Evan Wagley. Uh, first year in the industry, did $182,000 in GCI. We are less than three months into the new year, already crossed $162,000 in GCI. And we got to sit down and talk a little bit about some of the lessons he learned in year one to get to where he got to and how he's going to hit and I'm confident surpass his goal of doing half a million dollars here in his second year in the industry. And so going to share exactly what he shifted in year two to get to that level. Tune in. I am joined today by a good friend of mine and one of the rising stars on my team, Mr. Evan Wagley today. This guy's in his second full year in the industry and is on track to do over $500,000 in GCI. Evan, are you okay maybe sharing maybe just one or two things you've learned in year one that's kind of putting you in this position for year two? Yeah, yeah. I kind of have four things. Ooh, four? So, yeah. Whoa. yeah. Thanks, chat GPT. Shout out to whoever made that. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> um, <clears throat> yeah, I do have several things that I definitely want to share that got me over that initial hump. Like, what the heck am I doing to where I'm at now? Awesome. Guys, welcome to the Whistle Way podcast. My name is Kyle Whistle, your host with EXP Realty here in San Diego. And you are? I'm Evan Wagley, also from Whistle Realty, powered by EXP here in San Diego. Awesome, guys. The goal of the show is to give you the tools, techniques, and tactics to go out there and crush it in your business. The way that we like to do that is to answer the questions that you have for us. So if you ever have a question you want to have us answer on the show, you can always go to thewhistleway.com. You can ask us questions on there, subscribe to the podcast and YouTube channel, join our private Facebook group and email newsletter where we share a lot of tips and tricks and get dialed in on our referral network. We have a ton of people leave in California. We'd love to send them your way. We want to make sure we have trusted partners all around the world because we get people leaving the country as well. Um, so all that at thewhistleway.com. Also, if you're looking to level up your media um, within your business, audio, video, all that fun stuff, we have a course on there called the Media Mayor Mastermind where you can really level up thewhistleway.com. All right, I want to jump into this today. So Evan and I, we've known each other for 20 plus years now. Um, but a couple of years ago, let's just kind of backtrack to how you we got you into real estate. Mm -hmm. um, many years ago, you were licensed, didn't really do a whole lot with it. Mm -hmm. um, what have you been doing for the last 10 plus years? So I've been in uh, federal law enforcement for going on 15 years. And within that, I have learned a lot about myself in coming out of my comfort zone. I never thought that I'd be in law enforcement. I didn't feel I had the like alpha male mentality to be that, but I discovered that I did have that. And I think a lot of that translates into being now a business owner and finding those things about me that I didn't even know existed and Putting them, pouring that into my business to where I find success now. I love it. Yeah. And it was like maybe what a year and a half ago, you hit me up. You said you wanted to get together and you came to me and decided, like, hey, I want to do real estate. Like, why? You know, I've always known for a long time. In fact, uh, Kyle was my agent for when my wife and I bought our first condo in. Uh, 2009, the year after we got married. <clears throat> and I always knew that real estate was a vehicle by which I would be able to succeed financially, to provide for my family, to set myself up for retirement. I knew that that was the way that I wanted to go. And home ownership was the first step in that. Um, so that was the, the first kind of seed that was planted where I knew for myself that that was an important way for me to uh, be successful um, just in life in general. So fast forward then, I um, was able to purchase a couple more condos, sell a couple of condos with Kyle, and from that um, gained a better understanding of how real estate can be a real vehicle, vessel to... Um, 
to success, whether that's being an investor, owning your own home, or selling it now as a salesperson. Um, and Kyle's the one that opened that door for me. So then you decided, like, um, I want to be an agent. How did you come to that decision? You know, so I'm nearing the end of my career in federal law enforcement, and I wanted to have something that is challenging to me. And I've always been this way. If something isn't a challenge, and if I'm not learning and progressing and growing, I, I don't... I have no interest in it any longer. And there's an old quote um, that I always say to myself, it's either you're moving ahead or falling behind. There ain't no in between. And that's how I feel with my life. I feel like that with my family. Now I feel that way with my business, that if I'm not moving ahead, whether that's gaining knowledge, whether that's gaining experience, whether that's helping my family, if I'm not doing something actively to make myself better, I'm falling behind in basically everything. And so I know when he came to me, I've, I've known him for a long time. I know whatever he does, he's all in. I told him, I was like, look, if you're going to do this, I'm a little bit concerned because I know you. <laughs> and if you do this, like you're going to become obsessed, like mm-hmm. you're going to go all out. It's going to consume you. It's going to be your whole world. You're right. Has that happened? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but look, check this out. In, in last year's first full year in real estate, $182,000 in GCI last year. Correct. When I look today, I think you're 162,000 between closed and pending Correct. this year. Today is March the 4th. Correct. So we are, I don't know, was that 39? We're, uh, we're just over 60 days into the year, and you've already got $162,000 in GCI in the pipeline. Correct. It's pretty impressive. So 500, we might have to move the goalpost. I don't know if you know that. That's something we do here at Whistle. Like the goalposts get moved a lot. That's fair. Uh, So maybe 500 might be too small. Maybe we'll move those goalposts. But I would really love to share with people, like you're you're just over, I think you're 14 months in, if I remember. Um, Share with me a little bit about like what are the things that you learned in year one? Because I think there's so many misconceptions about how to be successful in this industry. Like what were the keys to your success in year one? And what do you... We'll start with that, and then we're going to shift gears and focus on what are you um, doing in year two to get to that next level. So let's break down the things you learned last year, year one, $182,000. Okay. If for me, <clears throat> I'm old school in the way that I think a lot of ways, in that I'm not the social media giant. I have like 600 people that follow me. They're my closest friends and family. I'm private on social media even. So, and I don't post a lot. Everything that I post usually has something to do with my kids that my wife tags me in. <laughs> I was going to say, what you <laughs> lack, your wife makes yeah, up for. Exactly. Which I, lo- I love. I love more than anything sharing the success of my family. I, I love them more than anything in this world. And so show, social media for me, I you hear so much oh, you got to get out there. You got to put your name out there. You got to be, you know, an influencer. Like that's not how I saw being successful. And for me, I knew that I'm not tremendously, you know, I don't have neither your eye and you or I have the face for TV. So I knew Quick that. Quick note as if you're watching this, just Google Walter Matthau. It's and, this guy right uh, here. It will be Evan. Yeah. Um, and so I knew that I just needed to do what I've always kind of done. And that is just work harder than anybody that I know. And if you apply that to literally anything, you will find success. It's It becomes, it transcends a numbers game because it maybe it's a numbers game at first, But then as you gain experience, you gain knowledge, you gain skills, it's really not a numbers game as much anymore. 
It's just, it becomes who you are and what you do and what you say. Like for me, I truly consider myself a realtor now, not just a guy that has some buyer leads and I'm showing them properties and writing offers. Like every square inch of my life, when I'm at my kid's softball game, I'm talk, having conversations, just regular conversations that end up being about real estate. Um, and I'm a knucklehead by trade. I'm, I'm not that smart. Um, and so there's, there's multiple ways that I've learned to become successful where I don't have to be better looking. I don't have to be smarter. I, all I have to do is work harder. That's literally it. That's the secret sauce. That's the proof is in the pudding, so to speak, that I know that like for anybody that's new, that wants to be a realtor <clears throat> and you're interviewing for whatever brokerage, XYZ brokerage, if you're not asking the questions, what focus do you put on training? What focus do you put on mentorship? What focus do you put on support for new agents? What focus do you put on um, systems? You know, what focus do you put on consistency? Like if you're not putting any, if you're not asking those questions as a new agent, then you're doing yourself a very big disservice and you'll probably be a statistic like so many other agents that get into this business. And I asked those questions to you when we sat down and you said, look, it's going to take more than just being here. You're going to have to put in the work. I knew that that's all I'm really good at is doing the work. And I've been able to find success from that. I think that probably translates to law enforcement too. Like when you joined first Border Patrol, now Homeland Security, like they didn't just give you a belt with a gun and be like, go defend Good the border. Luck. Like yeah. it didn't work that way, right? Like mm -hmm. what was the training like for those two different organizations? <clears throat> so I went to the academy first for the Border Patrol. It was a six month academy that was just a regular academy. And then there was a Spanish add-on for two months where you're, it's like basically full immersion into Spanish. Yeah. And it was really, really hard. Just, not just the experience of being there, but then also the experience of being with out my family. And <clears throat> I made it and I made it because I just kept my head down and I just worked through it. And there wasn't anything that was particularly difficult per se, but it's an everyday grind, right? Every day is just kind of hard. It's not undoable. Yeah. You can still do it. It's just kind of hard every single day for a long time. Yeah. And this business is exactly like that. It's just a little bit hard every single day. Yeah. And eventually it starts getting a bit easier over time. But if you don't get over that hump, you're going to fail. And we did have guys that failed simply only because they quit. Yeah. I would imagine too, like the amount of training there is so important because if you make a mistake in that field, that arguably could be life or death mm -hmm. here. The hardest thing that happens to you is like somebody yells at you, says something mean to you, like hangs up on you, like closes right. the door in your face. Like mm -hmm. talk about that, like how, you know, going from something that's literally risking your life to defend the country to maybe just getting hung up on. Like how does how does that translate over for you? It, it honestly makes it so much easier for me personally when I've been in life or death situations. I've saved people's lives in my line of work. So every other thing in life isn't a big deal. You know, I've had boats literally sinking from out from underneath people and we're throwing them onto our boat. <clears throat> so getting rejected or getting a couple of FUs on the phone, like not that big a deal anymore. 
So for somebody who hasn't been through those same scenarios as you, how do they get over that fear of rejection? The same way that I got over it when I first started in law enforcement, and that was taking a chance in myself. Before I, before I did law enforcement, I kind of had jobs where I felt like that was a good idea, so I went there, and nah, that was kind of hard, and I didn't like that. So I went over here and it got to the point where I really had to say, you know what, this is it. I'm approaching 30 at the time. I need to really buckle down and take inventory of myself emotionally, mentally, and say, I have to do this or else I have nothing else. And luckily, I've tr that's translated very easily into real estate for me where because I've had those skills of being in law enforcement before I've been able to have those that time of self-reflection and think I can do this I know that I can I've been here before and that experience means everything awesome what are a couple other lessons from year one <clears throat> for me, the training, obviously, if for anybody that's listening to this, that's a new agent that, or maybe you're going through the licensing process and you're not licensed yet, the training is so crucial. If you don't have, if you don't know what to do, like I'm such a knucklehead by example, my first offer that I wrote, I had a mentor. His name is Jeremy McCone. He's on the team. Awesome agent. He sat down with me on my first offer for five hours trying to teach this knucklehead how to do it. And if I didn't have that, I probably still wouldn't have written a first offer. So having support is huge. Two, learning from somebody that's already done it, not just in the things that are successful, but the things that aren't successful saves so much time and money. I mean, how many times have I asked you, hey, have you thought of doing this or that? And you're like, yeah, it doesn't work. And I'm like, okay, <laughs> on to the next thing. Like, it's that easy. Yeah. You know? And instead of investing time, money, effort into that thing, starting out when you're getting sold from a million different directions, try this program, try that program, do this, that. And I'm thinking, all of this, all of this sounds good. But somebody that's been there before says, no, just stick to the program, you'll be successful. That is absolutely everything. And without that, I probably would have spent money on those things. Can you see somebody being successful brand new solo or do you think starting on a team's a must is it possible of course it's possible for anybody to be successful if they're just that person you know they just have it you are probably one of the only ones i know that has that it that can do it on their own just from day one and you did but for the vast majority of us, you need to have the support. You need to have the training. You need to have the systems. Without those things, sure, you can be consistent, but consistent doing what? You don't know what to do or how to do it. If you don't have those in place, I'm sorry, there just isn't going to be a seat at the table for you. A year from now without it yeah I, that's one of the biggest mistakes and I, I wish I would have started on a team quite honestly day one like I think I would have been significantly further ahead than where I was right I, three years in had I started on a team like I can't even fathom how much further ahead I would be I think it's it's irresponsible for people to start out and try this thing on their own I would venture to guess half the agents on our team tried on their own Mm -hmm. and then join the team and then get traction immediately. 
And it's like, man, if you would have just started here, like you'd be so much further ahead and probably uh, in much less debt too. Like it's, it's crazy. Like if you're listening, if you're watching, like wherever market you're in, like just figure out who are the top teams in that area and just go interview with at least two of them. You need a basis for comparison. You should always interview at least two. Um, but just interview the top teams in that area. And, and I say the, the top teams, like the proven teams, because the amount of mistakes that we made or that I made, like building this thing in the first few years, like it was a train wreck in the first few years. So I'd be a little bit hesitant to join like a, a startup team. That'd be a little bit scary because they're still trying to figure out all their systems processes. Find the proven team the team that's been around for years, consistently doing big numbers, they're gonna have the systems, the processes, the training, all that stuff in place. Like, do yourself a favor and get over, like check your ego at the door that says like, yeah, but I gotta give them X percent. Like, okay, or you could keep 100% of nothing. Like, I, that's cool too. Like, that's zero. your choice. Yeah. yeah, I don't know if you're, you're gonna learn math, it's very important in this industry. Like, 100% of zero is zero, guys. Like just learn on somebody else's dime. And the beauty when you join a team, traditionally, you have very little, if any, expenses. Like the the team leader is gonna cover the majority of those fixed expenses for you. So you don't really have expenses. Like when you get a paycheck, you pretty much keep the whole thing. Maybe you pay some dues, some gas, some things like that. But outside of that, like you don't have the expense. I mean, my monthly nuts over $300,000 a month. Right, like you don't have to deal with that. Like that's the beauty of being on a team is somebody's gonna take that burden on so that you don't have to, and they're gonna literally just run or call the play, and all you got to do is, is just run the play. Right, played sports growing up, like just run the play that's called. Mm -hmm. It's really simple. It, speaking of sports, I as of recently, I don't know why I, I watched the documentary on Michael Jordan, so I've had this fascination with Michael Jordan lately. You know, he was cut from his high school team. Like, he wasn't good enough to be on varsity. Yeah. And eventually he did, because he kept at it. But he got to college, and his college coach, Dean Smith, was his mentor. He was his trainer. He was a second dad, so for all intents and purposes. And... Without that, would Michael Jordan exist? Maybe not. If it wasn't for that system, that support, that training, and teaching them, teaching him to be consistent, there probably never would have been a Michael Jordan. And you know that LeBron versus Jordan argument never would have happened. It would just yeah. be LeBron. Yeah. It's the same way in real estate. If you don't have the support, I think it's. And I, I would never talk down about any other brokerage, but if you're if a brokerage is selling a brand new agent a bill of goods that they could be a solo agent and be just as successful as anybody else on a team, I don't I I can't see how that's possible. It's really really not. And if you're new and you're listening to this, the only thing I can say is. If you're like me, I'm not tremendously talented at anything. I just open my mouth, I learn from my mistakes, and I don't quit. You do that, I promise you, and you get on a good team, I promise you you'll be successful. That's literally all it takes. So what are you shifting coming out of an amazing first year, coming into year two? You've almost matched your year one GCI less than three months in. By the time three months are up, you'll have matched it. What are you shifting in year two to get through that to that next level? A lot of the dumb mistakes are gone. Okay. <laughs> that helps. <laughs> what are some of those other mistakes that you were, were making that you like identified as, okay, I'm not gonna do that again. Nope, oh, don't do that again. Perfect example. So I am not the type of person that quantifies numbers and says, if I do this, I'll get this, then I'll get this. You are that guy. And you've taught me a lot about that. But one thing I've learned is I remember when I started and it's very easily because I have a dialer now. And so my strategy is talk to as many people as possible. And eventually someone's going to give you a chance. 
And when I first started dialing, which has been about over six months or so now, um, so eight or nine months into last year, I finally decided to, to start dialing. I was at about 100 conversations per appointment. Okay. And some of those conversations were rough, just really not good. Just nervous, shaky. I mean, the whole thing, run the gamut on things to not say in a conversation. I probably said it. <clears throat> now I've gotten to the point where I can book an appointment one in 21 conversations. So what does that mean? That means it alleviates a lot of time wasted where I don't have to just grind, 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 grind. I know I can set my time that I'm going to be prospecting every day and that's my time. And I know that in that time, I can make roughly 30 to 50 calls depending on who's answering and not. And so I can book an appointment a day. If I can book an appointment a day, then I know that from those appointments, if there's 20 plus appointments in a month, that one of those is going to transact just from two hours a day. Yeah. It's, it's not hard. It's, it's just simple mathematics. Yeah. But starting out, <laughs> your numbers aren't going to be that great. Right. But as you gain skills and as you gain knowledge and you figure out what to say and you drive around, uh, this is what I do. I drive around and I listen to cold callers on YouTube. On my, like on my car speakers, people are like bumping music, whatever. I'm listening to cold callers on YouTube because I'm obsessive and I want to say the right thing all the time. Yeah. And maybe that's not the level that everyone's going to be at. That's totally fine. I'm just obsessive like that. But that's the level that I'm willing to go to make sure that I'm successful in the avenue that I feel is the best for me in being successful in real estate. And I think the more you do this too, what you've been able to do is take it from 100 conversations per appointment down to 21. Where you're at now with your appointments to closings, that number is gonna significantly decrease over time too. And, mm -hmm. and I think that's the part we have to look at a lot of times is like, just start tracking and measuring all this stuff and start to realize like, how many dials you can make an hour when you're dialing by hand versus paying for a dialer. Some people are like, well, I don't want to spend a hundred dollars a month on a dialer. It's crazy. 150 bucks a month on a dialer. It's like, do you realize like how many more dials per hour you can make by having this dialer? And if you understood what the impact of, instead of going from maybe 10 hand dials an hour to 50, you know, dialer dials an hour, like you're five Xing your freaking output. It's insane. Like, and, and if you don't use a dialer, the thing too is I've, I've watched people, they get, they spend so much time preparing for the call. They literally do all the research. Then they make the call and then the person doesn't answer. It's like, what the hell did we spend all this time preparing when more often than not, they're not even going to answer the call. So you just prepared for nothing. Like I love dialers because I've watched it make people so much stronger because you just start to learn how to think on your feet. You get connected and you just go. And like you said, you were fumbling all over yourself in the beginning. And the more you do this, the more you get on there and you just you just start talking and you just start becoming conversational. This yep. one of the training programs I took in the very beginning, it was called um, from scripts to dialogues. Like what starts out as a script and oftentimes can be like very robotic. It stops becoming a script over time and it just becomes a dialogue or, or a conversation. Mm -hmm the more you practice it and the more you actually do it and you um, have somebody on the other end like responding back to you. So it's cool to watch you tracking that stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for me, I'm, I've learned that for any, for any perfectionists that are out there, show of hands, perfectionists, there's probably a bunch of you. For me, I want to, I've learned over time that I don't have to be perfect starting out. Who's perfect at anything when they first do something the first time? Like literally nobody, Yeah. right? Not even Michael Jordan. Yeah. Like, did you just get up and start walking? No, you had, 
your parents there to help you. You fell, you cried, you fell again, you cried some more. You hit your head on the corner of the table and you cried some more. And then eventually you took a step and then you took another step and then you were walking and then you were running. Like that progression, I think a lot of times perfectionists, uh, they don't want to look bad starting out sucking at something. And so they'll go their entire life even and not do that thing that they would have been successful at because they don't want to look bad in front of other people. As kids, we do it all the time. You know, we're learning all the time as kids. We're adults, but we're also in the grand scheme of life. We're still kind of kids. We should always be learning. And if you don't suck at something, that means you're not challenging yourself. Yeah. If you challenge yourself with this, with having the right support system in place, and you're okay with sucking at first, you can be successful at this. It's, it's not rocket science. Like, I know you've said this a hundred times. Like, how many people grow up thinking, man, I can't wait to be a realtor? Right. Like, literally nobody. Yeah. Right? They try other stuff. They go to school to become whatever. I got my degree in communication just because I was supposed to. I, that didn't take me anywhere. It didn't, I didn't do anything with it. But eventually, I was able to apply what I've learned in life because I'm okay with sucking at something. We played pickleball numerous times now and I suck at it. It's fine. It's still fun and I want to get better, but eventually you'll get to the point where you will get better. Yeah. And then you can be that guy that has all of that talent and all that skill and that perfectionist applied into your career because now you have the skills and the um, support and the systems, and you have that consistency, you can be successful. I love it. Awesome, guys. Well, hopefully you're getting a lot of value out of this today. If you are, if you're watching on YouTube, if you can hit that thumbs up button, let YouTube know. If you want more of the content, you can hit the subscribe button and the little notification bell. YouTube will make sure you're notified anytime we drop a new episode. And if you have questions, throw them in the comment section. Um, Brian Kochi and I will respond to all those comments personally. If you're on a podcast platform, if you make sure hit the subscribe button so that way you know whenever new episodes come out. Also, if you can hook us up with a review on there, Reviews on podcast platforms go a really, really long way to help share the show with more people. Um, so, Evan, before we wrap today, we like to do something we call the whistle widget of the week. This is something we utilize in the business that saves us time, makes us more money, or just helps us have a little bit more fun. What do you got for us? Okay. <clears throat> like I said, I'm, I'm a knucklehead. I don't have all of the apps. I don't have the social media presence like a lot of the other agents have. But what I do like, my widget is to be consistent in learning new skills, learning new mindset. If you're not progressing, you're falling behind. I, right now, I have multiple audiobooks going at the same time. But the one that I'm listening to now is Think and Grow Rich, Napoleon Hill. Yep. And the Part of the book that I'm in now is about faith and how if we believe it, it can literally become reality. You know, whether you're religious and you believe in Jesus Christ as your Savior and that he performed miracles, whether you believe that or not, it doesn't matter. The truth, though, is that if you believe it, like we really have the power to make our reality happen. And that comes, I've learned that a lot over the years, but more so it's helped uh, me in this line of work, being a realtor. And that comes from constantly trying to learn and progress. And if you're not progressing, then you're falling behind. Continue to learn. Do audio, read audio books. Listen to YouTube cold callers in your car if you want. If you're not, if you're not learning, then you're getting dumber. Love that. Quote that. <laughs> Save that clip. Um, mine will actually tie into cold calling because I think that there's a lot of times agents say like, I don't know who to call. I don't have enough anybody to call. I don't have. I don't need more leads. I need more leads. Well, there's really no 
limit on leads out there. Everybody who lives is a lead in all reality. Like everybody has a desire to own a home someday. And even the ones that like are naysayers, they know they really want to own a home. They just say that because it doesn't make sense at that point in time in life or whatever. Um, But there is pretty much an unlimited supply of leads that are out there. It's just up to you to go after them. So one of my favorite forms of prospecting for new business is what's often referred to as circle prospecting. Put a pin on a map on a property, draw a circle around it, and call everybody within that circle. That is known as circle prospecting. So you're typically prospecting around a open house you're gonna do, around a property you just listed or a property that just sold, and you're just calling everybody in the neighborhood. And those calls are not that hard when you're calling to promote an open house. Like that's why we love open houses. It gives me an excuse to call everybody in the neighborhood. Hey, Evan, it's Kyle over at Whistle Realty. You probably saw that sign around the corner on 123 Main Street. I wanna invite you to come by the open house. Like people don't hang up on you when that's your open. But when you call like, hey, I'm the local realtor. Do you want to buy or sell? Like that's when you're getting hung up on a lot of times. So uh, my favorite source for getting that data for circle prospecting is Cole Realty Resource, C-O-L-E, Cole Realty Resource. We've been using that as a team for years now. Huge fan of it. And you can literally pull phone numbers, names, addresses, email addresses, everything. So you could also then combine into an email campaign and a direct mail campaign to go along with your phone calls that you're making, which will drastically increase your response rate. So if you guys are looking to implement circle prospecting, Cole Realty Resource, um, if you shoot me a DM, I think I have a code. I might be able to save you a couple hundred bucks. So send me a DM on Instagram at Kyle Whistle, and I will hook you up with that code. Evan, appreciate you, man. This has been fun getting to go a little deeper with you. Um, And hopefully you guys got some value out of the show. With that said, we'll see you next week here on the Whistle Way podcast. Wait, wait. Before you leave, I want to share some more tips and tricks that we're using in our business to take it to that next level. Just click right here. And don't forget to subscribe. Click right here.